Thank you. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Madam President, distinguished faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure it is to be with you today. I'm deeply honored. This is my first trip to Towson, but I feel like I know the place because as Bill and I have traveled around the world from the White House to Darfur to Iraq and China and everywhere else, what I heard about on those trips was Towson, Towson, Towson. <laughs> Bill is full of Towson aphorisms, such as, there's no such thing as good writing, there's only good rewriting, <laughs> and all kinds of pearls of wisdom that he picked up here at this great university. Bill used to work for me, now I work for Bill. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that happens to a Towson graduate. They just keep <laughs> rising and rising through the ranks of their chosen profession. If there had been no Towson, there might not have been a Bill Owens, and with no Bill Owens, there would have been no me. So I thank you very much for the richness of the education that you get here at this wonderful university. Thank you, my friend. After all this time and all of this hard work and parents, all of your money, <laughs> there is only one thing standing between your diploma and you, and that's me. <laughs> this is your last lecture at the university, but you must pay close attention because there will be a test. It's a timed test, 60 years, more or less. You will determine your rank. You will score this test yourself. You will determine your rank in your class of humanity. Let's call you the class of 2071. You can only take this test one time and the score will be final. But like all of these standardized tests that you're used to, this one has certain tricks to it, and I can give you a little bit of advice on how to take this test. I'll let you in on a few of those tricks. First of all, the easy answers, the simple, seductive answers are almost always wrong. The people that I have met in my life and career who have taken this test successfully have always chosen the hard answers, the difficult path. One of those people that I met was on a 60 minutes trip that we took to Iraq to a place called Balad. In Balad, the United States Air Force had a theater hospital and this was the place where our most grievously wounded soldiers and Marines and others came in to have their lives saved. And there was a nurse working in that hospital, a lieutenant colonel by the name of Paulette Shank. I was talking to Paulette one day in the emergency room when we heard the helicopters come in. This hospital, imagine it, is a collection of 150 tents all connected together. Now inside these tents, is the greatest medical care you could receive anywhere on the earth, the latest equipment, the most brilliant doctors, the most compassionate nurses. But from the outside, it looks pretty primitive. The helicopters were coming in. The Marines had been engaged in a battle with the enemy, and the first Marine off the helicopter and into the emergency room was a young man, 20 years old, about your age, a little younger, named Kenny Lyon. Kenny was a lance corporal. He'd been outside his armored vehicle when a mortar round fell, and Kenny came into the emergency room bleeding from a hundred places. The trick in saving a person's life in a moment like that is just to stop the bleeding. That is the most important thing that has to happen. And as Kenny came into the emergency room, they were losing him right then and there. He had lost so much blood at that point. 
They wheeled him right into the operating room, and in the operating room, five surgeons worked on Kenny simultaneously. Two on his legs, one in his chest, two at his head, desperately racing time to try to stop the bleeding before Kenny expired. The surgery went on for three hours. It went on four hours. Kenny went through 100 units of blood when the blood bank in the tent next door ran out of fresh blood. Paulette Shank was standing in the operating room. The surgeons realized that they had put the last bag of blood into Kenny and they were not nearly finished. They looked up like, what do we do now? And Paulette said, I'll get more. She ran out of the OR into the blood bank and had the nurses in the OR open up both of her arms. They filled up a couple of pints of blood and at the same time, a message went out all over the air base that they were out of blood and airmen and marines and soldiers came running, streaming into the blood bank. Enormous line outside the blood bank. And they start passing pints of blood into the operating room like a bucket brigade, one after another. Paulette Shank's blood, the first two bags in. Surgery goes on another two hours. And they saved Kenny Lyon's life. Paulette Shank was confronted with a question on her test of humanity. When the question was, what now, she chose sacrifice and courage as her answers. When I think about Iraq, I think about a dear friend, one of the great combat cameramen of his generation a marvelous man by the name of Paul Douglas. And when I'm talking to young people around this country, I always like to tell Paul's story because it is a great story about perseverance. Paul, too, was taking this test of humanity. And being Paul Douglas, he rewrote the test a little bit to suit his own personal circumstances. But that's what's important about his story. Paul was an Englishman big, strapping man. And he'd been a construction worker in London when the economy fell through. And he didn't have work, so he started driving a cab. But he had always been interested in television news. He had no experience in television news whatsoever, mind you. He'd never gotten a degree in journalism. But he was interested in it. He knew that. So driving his cab around every night, when the evening news went off the air in London, he would pull the cab up in front of one of the broadcast stations. Somebody would get in the cab out of the broadcast station. They would pull away, and Paul would start driving. And he'd say, you know, I'm not really a cab driver. I'm a sound man. Well, Paul had no idea how to operate sound recording equipment, but he went on and on, week after week, people getting into the cab. He tells them the same thing every time, and finally, one day, the call comes in from one of the networks. They're short a sound man. They need him on the live shot tomorrow. Can you do that? Paul says, well, of course I can do that. I'd be happy to. So they're hanging up the phone, and Paul says, wait a minute. What? What kind of equipment will we be using tomorrow? And the guy said, it's a Shure M635, like always. And Paul goes, oh, sh great. Hangs up the phone, runs to an audio shop and says, quick, show me a Shure M635 switcher. I got to know how to operate this thing. Well, he goes to the shoot the next day. Everything goes well. And so they hire him again. They hire him again. And now he's got a job at one of the British television networks as a news department sound man. Well, he's so good at this job that the CBS London Bureau gets wind of him, and we hire him into our bureau as a sound man. And the first thing he says is, you know, I'm not really a sound man. I'm a cameraman. 
Paul did not know which end of the camera to look through. <laughs> but the cameraman at CBS showed him, and he turned out to be one of the great cameramen of his generation. He went with us to Darfur with Bill Owens and I to document the genocide there, and he spent so many months over years in Iraq shining a light, wielding that camera like a beacon into the dark recesses of the world where people really didn't want the truth to be known. Sunday, this Sunday, five years ago, Paul was working in Iraq with a number of other people with CBS shooting a story, a Memorial Day story, about U.S. soldiers in Baghdad. And as he approached a column of American soldiers, a car bomb went off, and a number of people in the party were killed. Paul was one of them. This is why I bring up this story. If Paul had stayed behind the wheel of that cab, he would be alive today but it's not where his heart was. Journalism made Paul Douglas's heart sing. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Whatever your chosen profession, wherever you're heading in life, don't settle. That is one of the mistakes that is made by so many people on this test that I'm talking about. The test for you, class of 2071. Don't settle. Find that thing that makes your heart sing. Find that thing that you would do even if they didn't pay you to do it. Listen to your heart. Make an early, correct answer on this test. There's another thing about taking this test. I told you at the beginning that it's a timed test. But you don't know how much time you have. And so you need to make the right answers on this test early in your life so that if, God forbid, your life is cut short for any reason, you can say to yourself, I did what made my heart sing, and I am glad. That's what Paul Douglas did. I got a great education at my alma mater, Texas Tech, but I must have been sick the day that they handed out practical advice. Because despite my great education, nobody ever told me that my dreams were impossible. I sent Don Hewitt, the executive producer of 60 Minutes, the creator of 60 Minutes, a letter when I was 16 years old. I could hear my heart. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew where I wanted to be. And Texas Tech did not prepare me to take no for an answer. Somebody should have told me, you grew up in West Texas of modest means. You don't have any chance of being a correspondent in 60 Minutes. But I didn't know any better. So I just went ahead. And as I went to television station and television station, and they told me, no, no, no. Every time I tried to get a job, no. I thought, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> I knew it wasn't me. They couldn't hear the song in my heart. Don't let them tell you no. If you hear the song in your heart, whatever that profession whatever that vocation may be, if you hear that song, do not let the no's that you will inevitably hear, do not let them drown out the music that you hear. 
You are right. They are wrong about what your destiny is. If you're sitting there thinking, gee, that sounds great, but you know what? I haven't heard the song. I don't know what it is that I want to do. There's nothing that makes my heart sing yet. Be patient, it will come. But what you have to understand is that there is so much to do in this world. Some of you are graduating, obviously, into a difficult economy. It's improving. It's, it's improving. But it's a difficult economy. If you can't find a job in the profession that makes your heart sing immediately, then join the great young Americans that I have seen all around the world making a difference in the world, saving lives in the world, like a young woman named Marcy Van Dyke who works for an organization called the International Rescue Committee. Bill Owens and I met Marcy in the, in the Sahara Desert as streams of refugees were coming in from Darfur. They'd been bombed and burned out of their villages, and women with children on their backs were walking hundreds of miles in the barren desert. Marcy was working in a medical tent, and she had in her arm, right here between her wrist and her elbow, an infant child that was starving to death. And Marcy had a bowl of formula and a teaspoon and this kind of thing takes hours and hours. You cannot stop. You cannot stop once you've started this process. And she was holding that baby and pouring that formula. Most of it was pouring past his lips. But she worked on it hour after hour and day after day and saved that baby's life. When Marcy Van Dyke was confronted with this test, confronted with evil in the world, she answered compassion. I was recently in Afghanistan with really brilliant young Marines, young men and women your age, in uniform, in a desperate place, combat outpost Burrow, named for Lance Corporal Burrow, who had been killed a couple of months before in the same company. They didn't have a change of uniform, but they were training young Afghan soldiers to defeat extremism in their country. When the test asked them what they could do to make this world a better place, they answered courage and sacrifice, and you can do the same. When the question is oppression, answer justice. When the question is poverty, answer compassion. When the question is suffering, answer mercy. When the question is a lie, answer with the truth. And when the test says stop here, you say go on. In a moment, you're going to get these diplomas. And your parents are going to be so enormously proud of you, as we all are. When you feel that paper hit your hand, understand we are not handing you a piece of paper. We are giving you the ball. Run with it. God love you all, and I hope each and every one of you graduates at the top of the class of 2071. Thank you.